Beauty, beauty. I've been trying a little bit of Italian. I know it's not good, but what they say when in Rome, oh yeah, there we are, fantastic. It's wonderful to see nearly all of you from yesterday, and in fact, one or two people we didn't see yesterday, so it's fantastic. I hope you've had a nice evening in Rome, those of you who don't live here. Careful, Michelle. Oh, oh, poor you, poor you. You've been drinking too much Roman coffee. Fantastic. Excellent. So, Ah, here's a question while we're as a little warm up. I was just thinking about the UN system and where the various headquarters are. And um, in a couple of weeks, I'll be going to UNESCO, which of course we know is in Paris. In the past, I've been to Geneva, which is where the World Health Organization is based. Every year, uh, every September, I go to the UN General Assembly, which is in New York. And I think to myself, when they decided where the UN HQs were going to be, why is it? that Rome got all the ones that to do with food. Does anybody have any answer to this? Because I was just thinking about it just now. This is just a, as an icebreaker, because some of you, mo most of you are working uh, for UN or UN related agencies. And I thought to myself, how much do you know about the history of this organization and why the three food agencies are all based in Rome? I'm looking at Mauricio because I know he knows chapter and verse about uh, the Rome. No, you don't, do you? Ah, Yori. You know this, do you? Can you hear me? Ah, okay. Yeah, I think it does. I think you have to tap on something. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, here yes. it is. Well, there may be people who are more informed than I am yes. for sure, but uh, everything started with the establishment of FAO, I think. Right. It's because FAO was established in 1950 something. Uh -huh. And that's where the Rome uh, agricultural hub was, was born. Yes. And that's how the, the agriculture related issues are taken in the UN fora here in Rome. Okay. Um, okay. Because then WFP followed, and then EFAD was established as a, as a site program of FAO at the beginning, and yeah. then it became a, a, proper, a proper institution. Uh, ah. Uh, here okay. In Rome. Thank you very much. Like I, you said I'm, that... I'm not sure I got the answers right. So if anybody is more knowledgeable Yuri, than I, I think, am, uh, may have may be able to amplify your answer. Henry, if you've tasted Italian food, you know the answer. Oh, well, that, that, that was the obvious one, but I thought to myself, it doesn't necessarily mean it's true. <laughs> Yuri. Uh, yeah. Uh, Yes, the Italian food is a, is a, is one of the right answers. Yes. Um, but to my understanding, uh, IFAD uh, was uh, already agreed to be uh, 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 set to, uh, in Tehran. Yes. Uh, but then came the Islamic Revolution, and uh, IFAD was uh, temporarily oh, right. uh, established in Rome, and it became permanent. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I had no idea that if I was going to... Ah, yes, sir. Uh, just to add to Mauricio, actually the World Food Program was part of FAO. Right. Started off as the emergency arm right, of, FAO. of FAO. Yes. And then, of course, over a period of time, yes. it gained some independence i love that gain uh, some independence said, we are breaking free yeah we are breaking well free. because actually i mean it is still uh formally uh part of uh fao yes technically yes indeed yes yeah. indeed well okay so. fantastic oh <laughs> yes right yeah it's weird like uh wfq's is the quell to fao and as always the ifad always it's the quell to you it's also as a sequel right and I think uh, FU also, uh, yes. sorry, yes, FU also had uh, this, I think, pre-story that there was an organization. I wasn't not sure it was pre-war. I'm not sure if it's linked to the League of Nations here in Rome, yes. which was for the, I think, coordination or, or documentation of, of various matters in agriculture. So while I think uh, FBO was initially in Canada right after the establishment of the UN, right. it was quickly moved back here in the, on the basis of that historic precedence. Wow, I wasn't expecting all of this. It's what they call collect collective intelligence gathering. It's spontaneous as well, because I mean, I thought to myself, I was going to get one or two jokey comments about Italian food. Thank you, Mike. And we got that. But I was aiming somewhat higher and we got higher and higher. So thank you very much. Uh, give yourselves a round of applause for a wonderful start to the morning. And let's say hello to all our colleagues joining us online, on Zoom, wherever you are, you are most welcome. Thank you very much. So we're on to day two of uh, the AGA, and let's recap briefly on uh, what we discussed yesterday. We focused on 
national pathways, did we not? Um, where are they since the Food System Summit of last uh, September, the stock taking exercise and the white paper indeed. And we looked at several countries in particular, including the likes of Niger, um, Cambodia, uh, Colombia, Laos, uh, Bolivia, uh, Finland. Uh, and as well as looking at the particular, we looked at general things, didn't we? Uh, general principles on country ownership, uh, support and catalyzing investments. And I think even the idea of fluids uh, came up as well. Um, today, we're going to look at three areas that need further attention, special attention. Uh, coming up very shortly, we're going to look at, um, well, this is a focus from the Global Donor Working Group on a land, re a responsible based land-based investing as a strategy to mitigate harms of a new food crisis. At 11, we will look at rural youth employment and food systems transformation. And at 1.30, uh, we've got a special high-level panel on building consensus and coordination on the current global crisis response initiative. So three uh, streams there, but of course, we're going to start off with land. And we recall, and in fact, let me, let me use a term that the Americans often use. We've seen this movie before, because we recall uh, what happened about 14, 15 years ago, the 2007, eight food crisis, the land grabs, the mobilizations of the powerful investors and sometimes governments acting with overreach, taking advantage and displaying vulnerable people, taking advantage of the need for more food and rapid delivery of food, pushing out those who are further marginalized, who've been made promises and those promises were not delivered upon. Things got so bad that in Madagascar, a government was even overthrown. Well, how did global donors respond? They had to respond. And we ended up with negotiations and then the adoption of the voluntary guidelines on the responsible governance of tenure. That was in 2012. But then a number of projects were initiated, some failed and community members were still kept out, marginalized and uh, sidelined. So what can donors do to help communities, governments and the private sector? We're going to hear in this session from five colleagues in the Global Donor Working Group on land. We'll hear from the UK's Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. We'll hear from USAID, we'll hear from the IFAD, we'll hear from the Netherlands, and also from the International Land Coalition. Let me introduce our uh, speakers. Three of them are going to be online and two here in the room. Online, we have Carol Boudreau, who is Senior Land and Resource Governance Advisor from USAID and Chair of the Global Donor Working Group on Land. There she is. Hello, Carol, good to see you. Good morning, Henry. So nice to see you and everyone in the audience. Thank you so much for leading our session today. Wonderful, we, uh, you sound in fine voice. We also have Gemma Betstema, who is Senior Program Advisor, the Netherlands Enterprise and Development Agency and Vice Chair of the Global Donor Working Group on Land. Gemma, hello. Hello, good morning, everyone. Nice to be here. Fantastic, brilliant. We also have online Chris Penrose Buckley, Senior Advisor, Land Policy, Foreign, Commonwealth and Development Office, UK. Hello, Chris. Your brow is furrowed. Is it because you are muted? Uh, yeah, that's why. Uh, good morning, everyone. I also have a tendency <laughs> just to frown all the time anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, we have Francisco Marquez. He's here in person. Technical specialist in the private sector at IFAD. Where is he? Please come forward and take a seat. How about there? Good morning to you. And we also have Michael Taylor, the man who loves his Italian Roman pizza, director of the International Land Coalition Secretariat here at IFAD. Thank you very much indeed. Excellent. So we're going to try and tell a story here. We've got various different actors, various stakeholders, and each of you is going to give us a sort of mini presentation on your areas of interest and expertise, and we're gonna build it into an overall picture. We're gonna start off with you, Chris Penrose Buckley. So you're with the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office. 
I'd like you to walk us through what happened around the voluntary guidelines, the adoption of them, and how the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office has uh, since then responded to the challenges of, and we all want this, responsible land-based investment. Chris, over to you. Thank you very much. And, and thank you um, to the platform for organizing this particular session, which I think is very timely, uh, given what we're seeing going on in the world today. Um, so I, I wasn't involved back in 2012. I think maybe others on the, on the, on the, in the meeting uh, may have been, no doubt, were involved in some negotiations around the, the, the VGGT. Um, but obviously, once they, they were announced, there was a, a, a sort of a big global sort of focus on, on trying to uh, support implementation of the voluntary guidelines. I think it's worth noting uh, in the context of the, the theme this morning that the VGGT primarily talked to the responsibility of states. Um, uh, there are some important um, directions in there for companies, for the private sector. But a lot of it, obviously, is talking about what the, the, the responsibility of states. Um, so back in 2013, a year after the VGT were approved, um, the UK government, back then it was the, the Department for International Development, set up a, a program uh, some of you will be familiar with called Legend, uh, Land um, uh, Promoting Economic Development um, uh, and, and Governance. Um, and the, the aim of that really was uh, to do a number of things. One of them was to promote more responsible land-based investment. Um, and let me just pause for a second, because I, I, I did rather late send a, a couple of slides. Um, if they are available uh, to Lisa, uh, they could be put up now. Thank you very much. Perfect. Um, and let me just say, well, I want to do two things. One is just to sort of reflect a little bit on our journey in trying to promote responsible land investment linked to the VGGT, um, highlight some of the, the, the sort of associated lessons and then just some very brief reflections on what that means for today. So if we can go to the first slide. Um, I think sort of a slightly complicated slide, but um, let me just walk you through this. So I think uh, if we're trying to promote responsible land-based investment there in the center, I guess it's, you can conceive of it as sort of as three sort of entry routes to promoting that. On the left, you've got sort of trying to influence business practices of, of investors, of, of companies investing in land. On the right, you, I guess another entry point is trying to promote community uh, understanding of their rights and advocacy and defending their territory uh, through a range of interventions. And then I guess the third um, entry point is looking at the, the role of the state, state regulation, and uh, what I have uh, called uh, uh, land investment approval and monitoring systems, somewhat um, uh, confusingly at the top, right? So I, I guess there's a whole system, I put it in inverted commas because it's really uh, designed as a system, but there's a whole process that companies need to go through, formal or informal, to acquire a, a concession or land. So I think our initial focus through this legend program was, was really on the left, investors and businesses have how can we help businesses understand um, how to promote good responsible land investment? And we had a number, uh, we, we funded a whole range of interventions, partners globally who were working in that space, and there were a whole range of insights, uh, which I've sort of listed down in the left below. And what, one obvious point, which I think we've all realized is that there's, there's lots of guidance out there <laughs> um, to help businesses make sense uh, of the VGGT, probably too much, uh, and clearly guidance is not enough, right? Um, that was a sort of fairly obvious insight. I think one thing we, we realized fairly quickly, too, is that a lot of businesses were focused on legal compliance. So that's the default position. Uh, businesses were trying to comply with national laws. Um, but really, to do good land investment, we needed to help them shift uh, beyond legal compliance to think about what we called social license to operate. Right. So in a context where laws often don't define land very clearly or at all, land rights, particularly customary rights, there was a need to really shift much more on a social license to operate, what the company has to do to gain approval from local communities. Um, I think the third thing we realized was that companies and investors um, don't really understand and certainly can't quantify the risks involved, right? And if they can't quantify them, they tend not to manage them sort of as a, a key part of their operation. So we spent quite a lot of time through projects like quantifying tenure risk that some of you may be aware of to try to help say how much does it actually cost businesses when when land 
disputes over land go um, lead to delays, etc. So there was some really interesting data we got around cost to companies. A fourth one um, was really if you want to reach scale, it's not that terribly useful working directly with companies. It may make a lot more sense trying to go up the chain to reach uh, investors and to inf and to sort of help them put more requirements on companies um, uh, around land. I guess a linked realization to that was that the, the, the IFC um, performance standards, which is sort of the benchmark uh, many use, um, that, that their, the particular section dealing with land uh, in those is not is, is quite problematic, I think, right? The starting point is how to avoid uh, resettlement. <clears throat> uh, if, 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 can you imagine any, a company in the UK or the US or Italy um, wanting to acquire some land and the main focus being how to avoid uh, involuntary resettlement, uh, none of us would think that would be an appropriate starting point. The starting point would be, do they have a right to acquire the land, right, and on what basis? Um, and then the last insight was around the lack of local uh, in independent support to companies who did want to do the right thing, right, and how can we uh, address that? So there are a number of insights which we began to respond to through new projects uh, and, and others as well, um, which I think have, we've made quite a bit of progress in that space. Um, Parallel to that, we had a big focus on community and, and action um, and working through partners like Namati uh, and others who were really trying to empower communities to understand their rights, to respond to them, um, to negotiate beneficial deals where they wanted to. Um, I think a big challenge there is just the lack of funding, right? So there's, there's so much need at the community level. Um, and the other one is how do you get to scale? Um, because there's lots of really good examples out there of support to communities, um, but you need much more support and and capacity and a sort of a quick, rapid response system um, to help communities. Because if you just train them in advance, it's yeah, it's a never-ending task. So that, that, that was the big focus. I think one of the, the the key conclusions from a lot of this work we have supported is that there's sort of a gap at the top, and. Um, what we realized was that a lot of the a lot of the companies we were talking to were sort of the same companies who were part of global discussions on response on ESG, environmental, social, and governance. Um, and we, the, the vast majority of companies uh, investing land, we weren't really touching them at all, right? They they didn't join global the fora uh, on on responsible land investment. Not surprisingly, they were often countries investors from India or China or from South Africa or from Nigeria. Um, and so we needed to really rethink how we could support uh, and, and, and reach them. Um, and then the other insight, I guess, related to that was that even companies who wanted to do the right thing often got into trouble because local systems and procedures were confusing or con in conflict. Um, and so they still uh, ran into, into local disputes or problems. So that, that was really, those are some of the key uh, insights. We just moved to the next page. I won't go through these, but just maybe a flag. Um, there was a whole sort of process to evaluate a lot of the lessons, more sort of operational, if you will. Um, and I've just put at the bottom there a link to the land portal um, page on Legend. And there's there's a lot of um, more detail there on lessons from from, from, this, from these projects. Uh, people are welcome to, to have a look if they haven't seen them already. And then maybe just to conclude um, the last slide, So, so I guess, what did this all mean for, for today and also for the work we're doing now? Um, I mean, I guess one obvious point is that the sort of high commodity prices we're seeing now and, and significant, um, very significant food insecurity around the world clearly were a trigger back in 2008-9, uh, not the only, but a, an important one. And so I, I guess it's very plausible to, to think that the, the, that the current crisis could well lead to a new wave of land grabs or, or unlawful land acquisitions, um, particularly given the fact that national systems to deal with investment haven't really changed a great deal. So I think there's a, a general reflection that we haven't done enough to work with governments around more transparent systems, right? And so I think that really, in terms of the international response, should be a much bigger focus. Um, how do we support land investment approval and monitoring systems, working with uh, investment promotion agencies, other bits of government, 
Um, none of this is easy because obviously a lot of it is, is around politics and incentives and and invested interests. But I think that needs to be really a much bigger focus. And then I think we also need to focus a lot more on sort of the, the bottom up, the community side action and sort of rapid response. Um, I don't know whether colleagues at Land Matrix or others are already beginning to pick up any any signs or data of, of a new wave. I guess it's probably too soon for that anyway, but it'd really be good to kind of coordinate across different actors to, to kind of keep a close eye on this. And then also see how we can join up different programmatic work to get a better sort of network of, of informants to support community response, right? So I think that's a challenge at the moment. A lot of these activities are not very well joined up. And so the information about new, um, new projects often gets lost. So let me, um, let me stop there. Well, maybe just one final word. So that, that's, that, I guess, our UK's new programming is really much more focused on the national level with government. So that, that's sort of, I guess, a shift for us. Um, and we're really keen to learn with, with others about how best to work with these national systems uh, or lack of those and, and support better and more transparent, uh, responsible investment. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much indeed. And um, I'm going to ask you a quick follow-up question in a moment. But before I do, and this is to our colleagues here in the room, uh, as I said yesterday, and to all those joining in online or what, 48 or so of you at the moment, you can use the chat box, our colleagues in the room, you can make yourself known if you have a, a follow-up or a question or something that you feel is relevant that you want to say. Uh, we have allocated some time. Uh, Conrad, already? Very, very briefly then, go on. Yes, it's a very brief one. Just on the last slide, Chris, you mentioned investor incentives. Maybe just a few sentences, if you could elaborate, please. What you're thinking of thank you yeah that, on, Chris. yeah if i may uh, yeah so I, I i guess i think we've made some progress uh we and, and others um trying to make the case to businesses and investors that this isn't just some sort of nice to have esg uh issue or, or um uh, but it, it is a fundamental problem to their to their investments right delays around land disputes do cause material problems to um, um, cash flows, returns to, to investments. Um, so I think, I think, but I think there's a lot more to do, right? To not just to get that message out and to, 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 to do more research and get better data to make that case to both businesses, but also investors and um, particularly investors for scale. Um, but I, I, I think, um, we, I guess that we, we, I think we've got the ear of uh, some of the development finance institutions who I think are taking this a little bit more seriously. But as I said at the beginning, I think there's still this sort of default focus on the, the performance standards, the IFC performance standards, which I don't think is the right entry point. Um, so I think there's work to do with uh, around those, but also uh, with, with particularly mainstream investors um, uh, and pension funds who are investing in this space. I'm thinking of work they've done on nutrition around really trying to link this much more into um, global monitoring of investments. Um, and so I think there's, yeah, I think if we are, are going to carry on focusing on the private sector, then that's really where I think we need to, to put, our, put our focus and effort. Tremendous. Thank you very much, Chris and Conrad. Thank you very much for the early question. Start as you mean to go on. Quick follow up from me, uh, Chris. Uh, given um, the gaps you've uh, identified in your presentation, I'm just wondering how sufficient the FCDO's tools are, the ones you've developed, if we face, and well, let's hope we don't, face a new round of land grabbing. Just a brief response on that. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they're not, they're not our tools, I guess. They're, they're kind of tools that partners have developed um, for others to use. Um, I mean, I think tools, I think, are, are, are valuable and important, but I, I think... Um, well, it depends what you mean by tools, right? I think so. That there's there's information, there's data. Um, a lot of it, as 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 also follow up question, uh, is is about incentives, right? And so, uh, how do we shift incentives so people want to use these tools? Um, if, so I, I think that's really the critical question. There are some companies who want to do the right thing, uh, and if they want to, then there are tools out there they can use. Um, I th um, and then, but there's many who 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 aren't aware of these issues uh, some don't even want to so i think that's where there's a much bigger challenge to to kind of shift yeah. the the awareness thank you excellent thank you very much chris for that opening presentation let's move on to carol boudreau i can see her waiting ready uh, to talk to us and carol just to remind you 
is a senior land and resource governance advisor at USAID and chairs the Global Donor Working Group online. And, and Carol, just wondering then what uh, USAID or USAID has done following the introduction of these voluntary guidelines, the VGGT. Please uh, talk about that for a moment, please. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, thank you so much, Henry. And, and what you'll hear from me is gonna echo in, in important ways what Chris was just saying. Um, so Liz has my slides. I've tried to keep my slides pretty brief um, and I'll walk through them and, and we'll talk about this. So Liz, you can go to the next slide, thank you. Um, USAID was very involved in the negotiations of the VGGT. Uh, USAID's um, former land lead chaired the negotiations, uh, and I was in, I was at USAID at the time supporting the the negotiations, um, and so excited when the VGGT were endorsed uh, just ten years ago in May of 2020. Um, what was motivating those negotiations was uh, in part, though not entirely, a response to the food crisis of 2007-2008. Uh, there had been other attempts to um, address the crisis that, was, uh, that had um, taken place. And Henry, I think you laid out nicely some of, the, some of the costs that were associated with that previous food crisis. The VGGT were really an effort to try to work with um, through three major groups to ensure that uh, there would be a more careful, there would be more careful attention to the legitimate land rights of um, people in different countries whose rights were oftentimes not recognized. So following the endorsement of the guidelines in May of 2020, all of us, all the donors got started. We had been started before that, but we really got started um, coordinating amongst ourselves. This is in part where the Global Donor Working Group on Land came from, a recognition that if we worked together it would be and coordinated, it would be easier for us to address these significant challenges that we were, we were seeing, the problems that we were facing um, with three categories of stakeholders. So how could we work more effectively with governments to try to improve the legal and policy frameworks that it looked like were leading to some problems around large scale land uh, based uh, land grabbing. How could we work with the communities on the ground who were really bearing the costs of the large scale land based investing activities? And how could, as Chris just really well, nicely laid out, how could we work with the private sector? Um, so at USAID, we, I think, tried to take a bit of a holistic approach that Chris just suggested, working with each of the three different uh, stakeholder groups. And um, I'll talk very briefly about how we engaged with each of them. For governments, I would say our, our focus has largely been, how can we work with governments not only to improve the legal and policy framework, and that might be through activities like um, support to create new land laws or new land policies in a variety of countries. Um, maybe the example of Liberia is a good one. USAID has been providing support in Liberia for many years. And, um, along with many other donors provided support for the New Land Act of 2018. Um, how could we then help the government to create, develop a draft um, and take to consultation with communities and other stakeholders, the regulations that are so important to implement laws and activities after the new laws are passed. Um, but legal frameworks are just one part of a really big and complicated puzzle that Chris was talking about even with a good land law, even with good uh, implementing regulations, if those laws and those policies don't actually grab and take effect on the ground, you're not gonna get some of the outcomes that you're hoping for. And I do think it's the case that we've seen, uh, even with an improving legal environment in many parts of the world, in Africa, in, in Asia, in Latin America, we still see real serious challenges around implementing land laws and land policies and policies related to addressing problems of large scale land based investing. Um, so, so USAID has done a fair amount of that work. Uh, currently we're working in 17 countries on land issues and um, have spent, our current spending is around just over $300 million. So this is the latest tranche of our work following uh, the 2012 endorsement of the VGGT. Um, and of course we had a previous tranche of work before that. So we can go to the next slide. And what I really wanted to focus on 
is not so much that work with government. I think there's still a lot to do on that front. But I wanted to talk a little bit about what we've done with the two other stakeholder groups, and that is communities and the private sector. Um, so what we've done with communities, I won't go through everything on uh, the, the left-hand side of the screen, but I, I will talk about one or two things. One of the things that USAID focused on doing, um, and this, this came about because at the same time the VGGTs were being endorsed, uh, there was a lot of talk in the land community about fit for purpose technology to record land rights. So we thought, wow, if we could help people on the ground to actually go through the, the um, cumbersome, expensive process of demarcating and registering their land rights using new technologies that were around, geospatial information, uh, mobile applications, maybe we could actually help more communities to get the um, to, to register their legitimate land rights. And that would provide at least some degree of protection from the kinds of uh, problematic land grabbing that we had seen previously. Um, so we've done, so we developed a technology which is called mobile application to secure tenure or mask at USAID. It's more of an approach than a technology, but we developed the technologies and have deployed mass technologies in a number of countries um, to help at the community level, communities register their land rights. Um, we've done this in, in, also in order to help governments meet commitments. So a number of governments um, coming out of that last food crisis made commitments to register and record land rights. One good example would be Tanzania, which made commitments to um, register and record rights of millions of its citizens, but didn't necessarily have um, at, the, at that time uh, all the tools that it might have needed to do this kind of work or all the support it needed. And then we realized, um, well, we need to go beyond just registering and recording land rights of individuals because in so many of the countries where we work, what's really critical is a registering, recording, and identifying the rights of whole communities. So now more and more we work with customary authorities to help them to register and record their, their traditional claims or their customary claims to land. At the same time, doing that, that work is not done by me, right? Because I sit in Washington, D.C. or by my colleagues sitting in even in missions. It's really done by local implementing partners. Um, and so we've worked very closely with those organizations, land alliances, local NGOs um, in the countries where we work to understand the approach, to use the technology, to work with communities, to consult, to help them understand what's going on. Well, this was set, this body of work with communities to register and record land rights using a fit for purpose approach um, supports government, but it also can support the pri private sector because at the time uh, the VGGT came out, as Chris was pointing out, there were some companies that were raising their hands and saying, we'd like to do things differently. Um, how is it that we do things differently? How can we avoid the problems uh, that we saw in um, 2008, 9, 10 that Mike and his team will talk quite a lot about? Well, like FCDO, USA did develop some tools and guidance. And, and Chris is right, you know, the tools and guidance only go so far. So we, we did develop tools and guidance to provide help, but we also started working with the private sector um, to help them understand how they could deploy some of these tools to map out and secure the land rights of their ingrowers or outgrowers, usually outgrowers, um, because some of these companies had made um, commitments to not have land grabbing in their supply chain. Well, how do you do that? That is really complicated, really difficult. But using these tools and these processes, we thought we could help companies to um, uh, do a better job of of preventing land grabbing in their supply chains. And, and we did work hard with these companies. Again, it's a small, it's a handful. Chris is right, there are not that many companies that are interested in this issue and that have the patience, the commitment to work through the process. But we have worked with a number of companies to help do this work and importantly, to bring women into the process and into their value chains as landholders, because we know that women are doing so much of the agricultural labor around the world. We know that their land rights are so insecure in so many places. And so having a purpose, having purposeful attention to having women be a part of the process, but also recognizing and, and working with community members and community leaders to recognize women's land rights 
could be a good contribution to improving their security, not only their land security, but their food security. So this is a bit of what we've done over the last 10 years, but I think the last question, and, and we have shared case studies, I can say everything on my slide is hyperlinked. If you are interested, please let me know and I'll be happy to share the materials. But the last question is the right question. You know, the conditions today in 2022 may be different from the conditions in some ways in 2007, 2008 around a food crisis, um, but there is a food crisis. And when there's a food crisis and prices start to rise, investors look for opportunities to acquire lands if they don't already own them in order to take advantage of the rising of rising food prices, uh, to grow food, to meet demand. That's important. We need to feed people. It's, it is a dire situation. But can we do more? Or can we do better to make sure that we don't have the same sorts of displacement, dispossession problems that we've had over a decade ago? And I think on this point, um, I'm going to agree with, I think, I think I'm going to agree with Chris and what Chris said. I, I'm not sure. I think we've been trying really hard on this issue for well over a decade. Um, and it has been challenging not only to work with the private sector, it has been quite challenging to work with governments as well to make progress around this issue. And so um, maybe I'll end, Henry, by saying, uh, I think we've done a lot, but I think there's still a lot more we can do in collaboration. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Carol, thank you very much. This leads me briefly into a quick supplementary. And if you can answer um, uh, very pithily, um, $300 million US that you spent in 17 countries, sounds good, but I'm sure you want to scale this up even further. Um, how? I mean, you've got a plan, I assume, to scale it up further. Yeah, um, I can give you one good example of our, our how U.S., not USA, but how we as a land community can scale this work. Tanzania is a great example of um, the government working with donors to come together to develop approaches to meet its previous commitments around registering land rights. Uh, USAID started working in Tanzania a number of years ago on that on a very small pilot project to do that community-based land registration work to provide that security to women and men in country. Um, we tested, we adapted our approach at the same time. Uh, other donors, including FCDO, were working, um, the Danish, I think the Swedes as well, on another project. Uh, that ended up aligning with the work that USAID was doing, or we aligned with them, or they aligned with us, we aligned with them, one or the other. Uh, but now the World Bank is taking up the approach that other donors have tested in Tanzania and will scale the delivery of land documentation to citizens across the country with an additional focus on urban areas. We tend to work in rural areas. So I think the way to scale um, in part, it is in part uh, a collaborative approach that works not only among donors, but with civil society to deliver the security that citizens need to protect themselves um, from wrongful uh, acquisitions. We also, I have to say, need to scale up by doing more work on the advocacy front. And I hope we'll talk about that too. Yeah. Really have people understand what are the, uh, the impacts and the costs of these kinds of approaches. So. I hope we'll get to advocacy as well, Henry. Thank you. Oh, yes. I think we're going to have a big, uh, strong voice in advocacy, I think. Carol, for the moment, thank you very much. And if you have any questions for Carol and you're uh, tuning in online, then do feed them through the chat box. If you're here and you want to talk, I'll say something in person. I'll hold your question till the Q&A, which will come uh, a little bit later on uh, in the session. Now, for our next speaker, who's sitting immediately on my left. So we've heard from the UK government. We heard from the U.S. authorities. Now, how about IFAD, one of the Rome-based agencies, our host here? Um, well, private sector. What about those private sector organizations who want to get involved but aren't quite sure how to? And what about those? And I uh, think, Chris, you mentioned in countries like China, perhaps, or uh, India or Nigeria. Nothing against those countries or the authorities or the businesses there, but you just mentioned those. How do you get them on board? So Francisco Marquez is a technical specialist, a private sector supremo. And uh, I'd like you to tell us about IFAD's work, Francisco, and engagement with the private sector. Thank you, Henry. And uh, I think it's good because uh, Chris and Kara read it. 
uh, touch upon the, the importance of the private sector in this field. Mm -hmm. So I will be briefly presenting uh, a little bit of what IFAD is doing in, in the private sector financing program. So, so uh, first of all, uh, I would like to mention that uh, the, our private sector financing program is extremely aligned with the IFAD mandate of, uh, uh, of achieving the SDG. So we are trying to partner with private sector entities to achieve food security and resilience. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's also because we understand that not only all, uh, governments and, uh, uh, can achieve these uh, very ambitious uh, targets of food security and resilience, and the private sector is a key uh, and most important player to, to, to achieve these uh, very ambitious uh, targets that we have and that there's still a lot of room to, to do. Uh, especially in this context of food, food crisis that was mentioned. So how do we intend to do it? So we, we have some financial instruments that are available, such as equity, guarantees, and, and loans that we provide and partner to, to these uh, private entities that have a clear uh, benefit for IFAD target groups, uh, being rural women, uh, rural poor uh, women and youth, and also we align with this, uh, these priorities that we have especially to fight climate change and, and to increase the food security and nutrition. So we, we intervene through this, uh, these entities providing counter-cyclical funding. And, and this is quite relevant in the period that we are living nowadays with uh, the, the, the recovery after COVID and the disruptions that we are seeing in these various value chains. And uh, I think it's important to mention that IFAD is doing this uh, partner leveraging the, the various uh, various projects that it has uh, already has in place and the experience of uh, many many years working together with the countries and also with uh, various donors that uh, support us in and also leverage the impact that we can do together so who are the partners that we have nowadays and why ifad uh, thinks that it's uh, essential that also Play the uh, play uh, an important uh, role in the field with the private sector because there is another uh, other donors that are doing this. But we see that, uh, uh, especially companies that are committed, uh, agri SMEs, aggregators, farmer organizations are not supported the way they need to 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 create this development that we are all the sustainable development that we are all aiming to. So these uh, these companies are not uh, enough big to be to be target of uh, private investors and are still uh, too small or not enough supported by the commercial players that exist. So there's a market failure uh, that exists and IFAD is trying to support these companies. We also support financial intermediaries uh, that uh, have, uh, have objectives, have values and missions that are aligned with our our uh, our mission so social commit social committed companies and financial institutions mfis that uh, that can support this uh, ambitious targets that we have and uh again why we have this unique position uh, that why because there is an other uh, international financial institutions and donors that are uh, supporting the private sector but we know there's still a huge financial gap in, uh, in supporting the these various uh, players in the agricultural sector. So in various uh, in different crops and value chains, we see there's still a, a lot of need for funding, technical assistance, and a lot of support and, and incentives to, to go in the right direction. So we, we are unique in the sense that we have the, the a specific focus on agriculture and smallholder farmers, rural communities, and, and to the real poor that need support. We have a high tolerance uh, of risk, especially credit risk, and we, we accept uh, relatively low returns, which is not the case for most of investors. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, also, and I can further uh, detail afterwards, we have uh, a low on size that is quite low compared to the other international financial institutions and multilateral development banks. So, we, we are recently, uh, sorry, we are new in the field. So we, we, we officially started in 2019, but uh, 
we are ramping up. So we only had uh, five uh, operations, but that are, were really aligned with our target. That uh, it, it does not include also the investment that the IFAD made in the agricultural business uh, capital fund, which uh, uh, IFAD the sponsor is one of the limited partners. But only on the private sector financial program, we already invest uh, 20, almost $21 million, mainly in sub-Saharan Africa, that where is the need is uh, it's, it's, it's greater. Uh, West Africa, e Eastern Af Africa, Southern Africa, and I was one in Latin America and Bolivia. So our average uh, ticket size, it's uh, relatively uh, uh, low, uh, below $5 million, and you won't see a lot of investors uh, coming to that level because of the transaction costs. Uh, and we are we are using mainly uh, senior and subordinate debt to scale up our intervention, supporting mainly food crops, especially staple crops that are uh, quite uh, relevant to, to the food security. And we aim to achieve uh, a lot of leverage uh, together with our partners to, to really reach the, the most needed and the, the most vulnerable rural people that uh, are, is our target. So uh, I, I think this is also a compliment a little bit of what uh, Chris and Carol mentioned. So the importance of supporting these vulnerable groups, uh, especially youth and, uh, and women, it's quite relevant. And we are aiming to, to, do, to, to have partners that have the same concern and that have the capability experience to leverage the impact that we can do in, in the field. So this is a, a major concern and we, we have been uh, we have been uh, incentivizing companies that uh, we believe uh, have this uh, mission uh, aligned with AFADs. And uh, finally, just to, to briefly uh, touch upon the, the, uh, the stringent process that we have and give a concrete example on, on the on, on land issue that we, we have been supporting. So we have a very stringent uh, environmental and social governance uh, uh, process in place. We, we do pay attention and have uh, stakeholders engagement when we are doing private sector investments and also have uh, always in, the, in, our, uh, in our projects grievance mechanism in case there is a dispute, including land disputes. So we, we, we really have a stringent process when we are analyzing one of the partners that we, we, we team up to, to achieve our goals. And uh, I wanted just to give this concrete example in Madagascar, where we, we supported, uh, we are financially supporting a company that uh, has a, a project, uh, a partnership with the Catholic Church and support landless migrants that uh, under contract farming. So they receive technical assistance, agricultural inputs, uh, a lot of support. And then they are able to, to work on the land that uh, in this case, uh, it belongs to the church or has the concession for, to the, the Catholic Church, the local Catholic Church. And, and this has really been uh, something that we, we, we expect to have a, a lot of uh, uh, development outcomes to the rural communities and, and to integrate this landless uh, rural people in the, in, the, in the community. So I, I would like to thank you. And thank you very much indeed uh, for that. Too. Francisco, um, you say that you're a, a relative newcomer to this uh, terrain, uh, but of course, I'm sure you have a sense of what kind of impact you've had thus far. What kind of difference do you think you're making? Yes, uh, yes I, I think uh, we, we recently uh, I heard from uh, the Babangona CEO mentioned the, the, the life of one, uh, uh, one young, uh, young man in, in the north of Nigeria that was, uh, that was about to leave the rural, uh, the rural communities, go into the urban areas and didn't have the money to, to, to buy the bike, that, uh, the motor, motorcycle that was important to him. And when he teamed up with uh, Babangona, got the, the assistance. Does everybody know Babangona? Tell us about Babangona. So Babangona, it's uh, an aggregator, but also uh, provides a comprehensive service to, to smallholder farmers in the north of Nigeria. And we have been supporting together with other donors uh, their financial needs. And they do this transformational work with uh, 
especially young people in the north of, uh, of Nigeria and providing all the, what they need. And this is really helping, uh, especially to avoid these migrations to the urban areas and, 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 and it's quite transformation. So it was quite impressive because mm -hmm. he mentioned, he was explaining about this, this young guy that was hopeless and thanks to this intervention became, uh, became empowered and uh, was able to, to have the motorbike that he really wanted and was about to buy the second one. So it was <laughs> okay. quite interesting. And when it comes to responsible land-based investments, um, what impact do you think you're having there? Uh, to be honest, I think the impact is it's still to be, to be greater. And in yeah. practice, it's a small. But I think we're going in the right direction of, of giving the right incentives, of teaming up and incentivizing and giving the... the the, the the floor and the the evidence to this, uh, this great partners that really take into account these issues and and i think that's the that's the way we should move yeah. forward to incentivize this uh, this partner mm. and as you said it's early days at the moment you know just a few years into it thank you very much indeed for that francisco okay let's move uh, to the netherlands that's right and Gemma bensema a betsema should i say who is ah okay do we have a quick Yes, make it a brief one because we've got time for Q and A's a little bit later on. But make a quick invention. Yes, I have a question. Um, one of the main problem of the private sector to invest in emerging markets like Africa is the political um, uh, risk. Uh, what IFA is doing in order to um, reduce the political risk for private private sector? This is um, important. Uh, I represent an international group that launched um, recently a new investment model for Africa in the frame of par uh, uh, public-private partnership. So, Thank you, Ari, for that one. Well, you said you had a high tolerance for risk, but it depends <laughs> on where the risk is coming from. Yes, yes, we do. And then we try to go on the, uh, on the really low-income countries and countries where there is the need for uh, for uh, additional private sector investments, and uh, we do analyze in terms of credit worthiness of the the counterpart and also the the, the risks that involve the the country. But IFAD has a has a long long uh, relationship with this country, so there is a lot of uh, understanding. There is a lot of uh, discussions and and. Also, I think that this is mitigating uh, partially the risk that exists for these counterparts. And since we are investing on these very small companies, the risks, uh, and I think you are probably mentioned to expropriation or this uh, sort of uh, uh, risk, is quite, uh, it's quite low if, uh, if you think about it. Ari, for the moment, thank you very much. If you have a follow-up, we can do it later. Thank you very much. And also, um, not forgetting those watching on Zoom, um, you can feed your questions through and we'll... Uh, try and address them a little bit later on in the session. But now let's go to Gemma Betsema, who is the Senior Programme Advisor, the Netherlands Enterprise and Development Agency and the Vice Chair of the Global Donor Working Group Online. Gemma, thanks again for joining us. So can you discuss the RVO's work and uh, the land at scale work, please? Over to you. Yes, of course. Um, I'll talk today about, um, well, some of the work that we did from the Netherlands, um, so not just RVO, but um, from, uh, from the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, on responsible land-based investments and how to make those investments more relevant and beneficial for local communities. Um, the focus uh, for today, um, I want to look mainly at what we did working with, um, in specific, the Dutch private sector. Uh, our financial sector as well, because that is something that, um, that we've uh, invested quite some time in over the past years. Um, and this work was always done in close collaboration um, uh, from government side, but also with NGOs and with academia. So just to, uh, to start there. Um, on my first slide, I just highlighted, um, well, maybe the three main chunks that I wanted to, uh, uh, to mention here. Um, I think what is very important for us to mention is that uh, following the, uh, the, uh, the food crisis 2007-8, 
Um, one of the things that really started um, is that we, um, uh, well, invested a lot in research and learning, uh, mainly through uh, knowledge platform uh, Landoc, um, but also in other ways. Um, and I think we were, of course, not the only one there, but a lot of others uh, and, and also us from the Netherlands, we were really trying to see um, uh, well, to do some research and fact finding on what was actually happening. Um, there were a lot of media, um, uh, a lot of media attention for, for the issue of land investments, land grabbing. Um, but what was happening? How big was the issue? Who were involved? Um, and, and then from there, what would also be our entry points for engagement? Um, and then the two main um, things uh, that I wanted to mention today that we worked on um, following uh, also this research was um, some active engagement we did with the Dutch private sector through um, uh, something we called a land dialogue, where, um, well, we had um, uh, quite a, a big number of uh, Dutch private sector representatives, um, but also um, uh, different parts of the government um, and, and civil society and academia was there. Um, and then I also uh, indeed talk a little bit about uh, the Land at Scale program which is, um, I would say, um, mostly supporting land governance more generally, for example, through um, uh, community land rights registration. Um, but we also find some emerging angles um, uh, through which we are also within the Land at Scale program now um, uh, working on promoting uh, responsible land-based investments again. Um, so for the next slide, that's the one on, uh, on the land dialogue which was um, set up in 2014 um, as a multi-stakeholder uh, exchange on responsible land-based investments. Um, as I mentioned, a strong involvement of um, especially Dutch agricultural and infrastructure companies, because that was something we found, that those uh, sectors were um, uh, very much involved in, uh, in land-based investments in other countries, um, but also banks, insurance companies, uh, and pension funds. Um, we had um, basically two main components to this land dialogue. On the one hand, um, there was this high level dialogue annually uh, with our Minister for Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation, um, where also um, uh, company CEOs, um, directors of NGOs, professors from universities were attending. And this was really uh, important um, uh, to get it higher on, on everyone's agenda, uh, also on the political agenda, but also on the agenda of, uh, of companies in the private sector. Um, and at the same time, in parallel to that high level work, we were also um, uh, a couple of working groups were set up around specific issues uh, and topics. For example, um, we had a, a working group on free prior and informed consent. How do you do that as a company? How does that work out in practice? Um, studies were conducted to identify, uh, well, the relationship of the different important economic sectors from the Netherlands um, and where we were active abroad and, and investing in land. Uh, um, there is uh, yeah, close communication or yeah, close communication and exchange between the different sectors. And um, that started with the land dialogue and bringing people together. But I think that is really something that we still see ongoing now uh, in the Netherlands, that it, it has made it easier for, um, for different people to find each other in, in case of questions or, or issues or problems. Um, and um, yeah, there were, uh, well, uh, a whole number of workshops, expert sessions, roundtables, uh, discussing the voluntary guidelines, um, FPIC I mentioned, fit for purpose, land administration, uh, a whole range of topics. Um, and um, yeah, one of the things that also came out of this dialogue was that through the years, uh, a number of uh, participants to the dialogue did indeed actively uh, start to include land governance, but also the voluntary guidelines in their CSR policies. Um, so that was really part of the yeah, awareness creation uh, of, of, the, of the dialogue. Um, and then we also had a nice setting for discussing uh, yeah, some specific case studies here and there. Um, so that, that well, the, the land dialogue is, um, uh, was started in 2014. Um, I think, well, we ran for five years. Um, and then uh, we in 
2019, maybe to go to the next slide, um, the Land at Scale program was started up. Um, yeah, to make the link uh, to the land dialogue, um, what we are currently looking at is um, to see, because I recognize uh, also very much what uh, Chris and Carol were saying, that um, we do have a lot of um, uh, important guidelines, um, guidance documents, manuals now, um, but you do still see uh, a need for yeah more tailor-made type of um, uh, input for uh, for investors for companies. So we're trying to see if that is something that we could respond to as well from the land at scale program. Um, but just to introduce land at scale also here uh, briefly, it's a central land governance program for implementation at country level um, in close coordination with our embassies. Uh, we have a portfolio of 14 countries um, in which um, project partners uh, uh, are strengthening land governance uh, in country. And um, uh, quite a few of the activities are focusing on community land rights registration, uh, the link of community rights uh, to the national system, national cadastres, um, building governance systems, uh, women's rights, climate change, land use. So this land at skill program in a sense is also really building uh, kind of a, yeah better land governance and also an enabling environment and if you connect it again to private sector investments it's also um, contributing to yeah hopefully building a, a, an enabling environment for uh, more responsible um, land-based investments um, some of the things there um, within land at scale that are more specifically focusing on, on private sector engagement um, is that we see that um, by having those, uh, by having uh, a number of projects in country um, and already building on the relationships that were formed in uh, the land dialogue, we can see that it is easier to make the connections. So to bring in um, our implementation partners in the countries, uh, very most often um, uh, NGOs from the countries, to bring them in contact with, um, for example, um, uh, hair companies or investors interested in, in maybe starting investing in, uh, in the country. Um, what is interesting also is that um, the Land at Scale program uh, is managed by RVO, um, which uh, next to managing a whole number of development programs, uh, we also are running some of the Dutch investment support programs for uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, and also for some, some other ministries. And this really offered interesting collaboration opportunities for us. Um, so within the organization, it was quite easy to also uh, uh, yeah, uh, have organize brief introductions to the voluntary guidelines, uh, land governance, um, uh, as well as uh, providing tailor-made support uh, to some of our colleagues. Um, and this is what I just mentioned before that we are currently exploring um, what we call until now uh, sort of a land desk uh, where we might um, try and uh, better link the more uh, general land uh, responsible land governance um, documents manuals uh, to more tailor-made supports um, also very explicitly bringing in uh, not just the legal aspects of when you are investing in a country, but also um, bringing in the, the more informal um, uh, things that you should really be aware of as, um, as, as uh, investors and, uh, and, and so on. Um, and um, what is interesting um, as a last thing to mention is that the Land at Skill program very much runs um, through our M. Embassies. Our embassies in countries are very much involved, and for us, this is uh, this has been a really interesting, important step. I think because um, because of that, uh, land governance has also uh, yeah came higher on the agenda of, of our um, um, very many colleagues uh, working in uh, in in countries from the uh, from the embassy uh, embassy sites. So um, yeah, uh, maybe I'll I'll just leave it there and uh, please let me know if there are any any questions yeah uh, Gemma there probably will be in in the room and through the chat box I can see it's being populated with quite a few questions and we'll field those uh, shortly I was actually going to ask you where the future 
of this work is going because you mentioned 2014, the land dialogue morphed into land at scale in 2019. Um, but I think you almost answered it already when you were talking about the legal aspect and um, informal, but, but is there anything you want to add about where this work is going? Because it sounds as though you've got quite an agenda. Um, I think what the interesting thing was about um, having the land dialogue, and even though those high level um, um, events are, uh, are currently not happening uh, anymore, I think there was also at that moment, 2014, a real need to be able to put it higher on the agenda of, uh, of different people. Um, I really think that it led to this um, uh, that to this tight network, or yeah, to to really closer um, closer linkages between people from the private sector, people from NGOs, and also building um, building trust um, amongst each other. Not not to uh, yeah to be um, hopefully to feel more. Uh, uh, um, secure to be open to each other and to really share um, uh, experiences. Um, and I think this is really something that, yeah, we should build on because this is uh, a good basis for also, um, yeah, bringing that back into the to the land at skill program and i think yeah the land desk is, is now something that we are exploring to see if if this can if if it can be made more concrete in that way um and uh, yeah as you said in, the land desk could really be um, a place where hopefully um, we can build on a lot of the responsible investment guidelines uh, manuals um, but also bringing in uh, context-specific knowledge um, that is uh, crucial in, uh, yeah, in, in doing uh, responsible land-based investments. Very good. Thank you very much, Gemma. Well, 14 countries and growing. Thank you. And now to our final speaker who's here in person, um, Michael Taylor, uh, Director of the International Land Coalition Secretariat, which is housed here at IFAD. And uh, Michael, I mean, uh, can you talk to us about your recent ILC study. Um, uh, tell us what concerns remain and where progress has or has not been made, what we should be doing about it. Thank you, Henry. Mm. Uh, are you the only one who can stand up? Or would I no, 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 allow no, me no, to no. stand up and... Be kinetic. Thank you. Give thank us you. your Sorry. energy. I can feel it right now. So I think please. we all spend too much of our lives uh, sitting down. So forgive me if I if I stand up just to uh, to make this presentation. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is just express the the sincere appreciation of ILC of our network for organising this session on land as part of your meeting for inviting us to be a part of it, uh, and for the, the continued good work you do, particularly through the Global Land uh, Donor Working Group, which is a working group of, uh, of this platform. We find that a very important, we're not a member, but we do get invited sometimes, a very important um, way of, of keeping uh, work on land harmonized, connected, um, getting up to speed with, with where challenges lie and, and building joint action. Uh, and I, as you can imagine, we believe that's, that's very, very important because we work on an issue which is underlying many of the crises the world faces, including crises that are being talked about a lot in this meeting, but often land is the sort of invisible factor uh, underneath. So uh, if you'd allow me, I'd just, I'd just like to, before getting into this, just reflect a bit on something that's been preoccupying uh, me and my team uh, and our network in the last few days. Uh, we were contacted by members in Tanzania at the end of last week uh, in, a, in a village called Loliondo uh, and another village called Ngorongoro to say that the police, the army was coming into the, the community lands in big numbers and they, they, they were very worried about what was going to happen. Um, this wasn't the first time they've been threatened with eviction before. This is a, this is a, um, a wildlife conservation area. Uh, and the government has said that they want to use this land for uh, wildlife conservation and particularly for, for uh, controlled hunting. In the Loliondo area, uh, the, the, there's an investor that the government wants to give the land to um, from Saudi Arabia that wants to use it as a hunting uh, concession. Um, we were naturally worried and sure enough, uh, a, short, a short while later, a few hours later, we started getting a film of live ammunition being used uh, on the communities uh, and then predictably some rather awful pictures of injuries uh, that communities, community members sustained. Um, from the violence that then that then broke out. 
Unfortunately, this is a very common story uh, in our network. Just two weeks ago, we were reported by our members in Uganda of an indigenous person that went into his ancestral land inside a national park to go and uh, collect uh, wild food and was shot and killed. Um, so these are stories that come again uh, and again. And, and as we heard, in many ways, Tanzania is, is an example of good land governance in theory. Tanzania has one of the most uh, um, progressive land laws uh, that exists uh, in Africa. Tanzania has been very active in the VGG program. So the question is, how is it possible in 2022 with such a forward-looking set of policies, such a good legislation, that people are still being kicked out of the indigenous peoples are being removed from their ancestral land violently or killed in the name of conservation or in the name of investment. That simply shouldn't be happening. It's, it's, it's in violation of everything that we've been talking about as the voluntary guidelines. It's in violation of a whole host of, uh, of international agreements, even binding agreements in violation of ILO 169, in violation of uh, the responsible agricultural investment principles. It's in violation of the Convention on Biological uh, Diversity uh, and many others. So that's just to frame a little bit both possibly the progress we're making, but also the very, very real challenges uh, that, we, that we face. So as has been mentioned uh, several times, we celebrate this year the 10th anniversary of the adoption of the voluntary guidelines. And I wanna come back to, to, to what maybe we can reflect on with Tanzania uh, at the end. But first, just to sort of give a bit of an overview of, of what's happened over the last 10 years uh, and where some of our successes are and where some of maybe our challenges uh, remain. So 10 years ago, the government of the world came together uh, and uh, adopted at the Committee for World Food Security this really groundbreaking agreement. It was the first time ever that there was a global agreement. Um, it was hot on the heels of an African agreement, the Africa Land Policy Framework and Guidelines, which is adopted, was adopted uh, three years earlier, two years earlier, uh, in, um, by the African Union, African Development Bank and the Economic Commission for Africa. But this took it global uh, on an issue which is politically contested, um, often very polarizing, very difficult to find a national agreement, but it did it, and it did it in a very inclusive, uh, very inclusive manner. Uh, and actually what's followed, I think that, that sparked a whole lot of um, very forward-looking agreements. So a few years later, then we had also from the Committee for World Food Security, the responsible agricultural investment principles. I don't think we would have land as we have it in the sustainable development goals if it wasn't for the progress we made through the voluntary uh, guidelines. Um, and, and we see still coming out, the European Commission just right now uh, is putting out directives for um, uh, companies to respect human rights, uh, European companies to respect human rights, including in relation to land in companies where, where they're uh, investing. For our network, our network is a, a, um, a coalition of 300 organizations around the world. Of, of many kinds, um, farmers' organizations, indigenous peoples' organizations, women's organizations, NGOs, uh, research institutes, multilateral and UN agencies. Um, the voluntary guidelines was the inspiration for what our members call people-centered land governance. So I've pulled out 10 principles from the voluntary guidelines, which, which are the charter for our work, the everything that we do, the how we measure our, our success. So they're really key. And, and um, two weeks ago, our members met at the Dead Sea for the, uh, for the um, Global Land Forum. And the declaration that they put out started with a, uh, a, a recognition of the importance of the voluntary guidelines, the continued importance of the voluntary guidelines as we celebrate their 10th anniversary. So, so we've made a lot of progress. And, and in fact, going back to the Global Land Forum, one of the, um, one of the uh, things that marked, uh, for me, some of those discussions was hearing again and again, government officials standing up and saying, um, we're working on land reform in our countries and we need civil society. We need uh, our civil society organizations to work with us in this joint effort. Uh, and this kind of partnership and trust building, I think, is one of the biggest, um, the biggest results of uh, of, of uh, what the voluntary guidelines set in motion and, and many things have followed on. Now, one of the things that I'll see that we've seen um, over this process is the power of data, how powerful data can be in bringing attention to, uh, as I said at the beginning, often what is a very invisible process, land rights, 
land rights are not always on front page of newspapers unless there are violations as, as what you've been hearing about but the the sort of the the, the underlying resolution of 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 conflict of marginalization of of dispossession um often isn't what make what makes the headlines so uh, ilc is part of three different partnerships uh, that uh, monitor um the the progression of what we call people-centered uh, land governance um we this can be applied to the vggts it can be applied to the land and sdgs so uh, the global land governance index landex is is the umbrella of that the land matrix uh, is is a partnership that's been monitoring large-scale land acquisitions uh, and landmark is the partnership that's been that it continues to monitor um community claims on land so a bit of a bit of uh, data for you what do these monitoring um, partnerships tell us about, in practice, whether we see uh, the voluntary guidelines, the extent to which we see the voluntary guidelines uh, being turned into reality on the ground? So this is from a report that's just come out from the Land Matrix uh, that covers um, a number of countries in Africa. You can see the countries uh, highlighted uh, and uses Landex and Land Matrix indicators uh, to to assess the extent uh, to which the principles uh, of the voluntary guidelines are reflected in investments, land-based investments in Africa. Unfortunately, uh, and I guess rather predictably, the results are not very good. So, seventy and I think Ward already put these data this data in the in the chat box. Seventy-eight uh, percent of land deals show unsatisfactory compliance with VGGTs. And you can see on the map there, just three countries uh, are showing um, a score of above 50%. Everybody else is under 50%. 84% of countries have deals with unsatisfactory compliance. It's not a new problem. Compliance has always been a problem. But the, the challenge here is, 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 is clearly that where the VGGTs have been a good reference point, but they're not enough to get uh, compliance rights and of course there's uh, as we heard from the previous speakers there are many many efforts to um so could you put the next one there are many efforts to to turn these kind of um principles into practice but here's some more data that shows that shows the challenge of that so this is a score on each of the indicators related to the vggts in the investments that were looked at from the land matrix database um and you can see generally the scores are not good an average of 32.8 uh, uh, out of uh, out of 100 and in fact even more worrying when you look at what the lowest scores are so the lowest scores to, are to do with consultation consultation with local communities fpic free power and informed consent especially with indigenous peoples is really a, a widely accepted and fundamental um, prerequisite to responsible land investment and we see that scores uh, that's one of the lowest scores inclusivity the the inclusion of local communities in the investment model uh, and then even even most worryingly of all respect of legitimate tenure rights especially of indigenous peoples um now in assessing uh, and in trying to follow good land governance obviously transparency is very key because if you don't have transparency how do you actually know whether there's com there's compliance or not so so uh, just the last figure that i'd like to show and i encourage you to look up the report it's on the landing page of the land matrix www.landmetrics.org um and uh you, you can you can get all the data there but the, the the last one that i wanted to pull out was on uh, on transparency and you can see really quite dismal transparency uh, rates uh, uh, across the countries only only two countries um, having a, a score of between 20 and 30 and everything else um, below that so just just then in in conclusion just from from that data alone um, maybe highlighting what we would see from the ioc perspective as uh, as three of the most urgent tasks that we also a part want are working hard to be part of the the solution to the first is the continued and ongoing challenge of fast tracking uh, land reform we've been talking about land reform particularly in uh, in in the african context that that data came from uh, for a long time and and many countries have very progressive policies such as tanzania 
but we're not seeing the pace of change uh, that, that, we, that we need to see. Our uh, um, contribution as ILC is largely through su um, supporting national land coalitions. So wide partnerships at the country basis to develop a strategy for change towards better land governance and working together with different uh, partners, particularly the government and, and where possible the private sector uh, to, to try and move towards a more people-centered uh, approach to land governance. Corporate accountability obviously is, is key and, and many of the speakers before me have, have spoken well about it. Uh, and transparency and monitoring. Um, we can't monitor unless we have transparency, but also monitoring. Um, we've, we've struggled monitoring land in the SDGs. In fact, almost no countries uh, have given a comprehensive report on the land indicators in the, S, uh, in the SDGs. Uh, and so we're working very hard on civil society monitoring. One of the speakers yesterday mentioned it, and I was very glad to hear. Um, greater recognition for the, uh, the, the, the huge contribution that civil citizen data citizen-led data initiatives can have, particularly on issues such as land in which there may be very, very different perspectives and often even different data, depending on what your, uh, on what your perspective is. Um, and we will be working with uh, the FAO, uh, UN Habitat and CIRAD uh, very shortly to establish a global land observatory that we hope will be um, a point of reference for putting out uh, data with respect to the VGGTs, with respect to land in the SDGs, uh, and, and make visible a lot of what, uh, without that data, uh, it's invisible. So let me just come back to, to reflecting on, on this uh, awful and ongoing situation uh, in, in Tanzania. Uh, and in fact, in the world, uh, in, in, the, in this point we, we are at, uh, I was interested that almost everybody who spoke in this panel mentioned um, the similarity in, in conditions that we face now as we did 10 years ago, just before the VGGTs, 12 years ago, just before the VGGTs were adopted. And so, and so we, we, we don't see it yet, at least as I'll see, we haven't yet measured it yet, but we, we do see the possibility for uh, um, increased land grabbing and increased uh, land rush. And so we need to be prepared both for what's coming, but at the same time, maybe we could also repeat um, uh, be, be more prepared to, um, uh, to, to, to renew our tools, to renew our approaches, to, to, to not necessarily fall back on the VGGT, but take the, what the VGT has given us forward with approaches that are ready, not just for the 2000s, but for the 2020s. Um, and um, I think as we, as we look at, at Tanzania and a country which, which in many ways is a model, but such fragrant and, and, and violent um, disregard for, for agreements that the government uh, has made and investors ready to go into such uh, context of, of human rights abuses, but, but still ready to go in. Uh, what is it that we need? And, and here's three, three points. But I think for us in RLC, the key point, and this is really the center of our strategy that our members have just adopted that will take us to 2030, is we need a power shift. We need a power shift. We need, uh, in, 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 when talking about land governance, for, for people in those countries uh, who work on the land, who live on the land, and when I say those countries, I mean all the countries in the world, because this is not an issue just of, of some regions and not of other regions people whose, whose livelihoods are based on the land to be really part of decision-making, to be really part of uh, deciding what happens on their land for whose benefit uh, and how. And that's why for us, national land coalitions, they're, they're often multi-stakeholder platforms, are such a, key, uh, are such a key way forward because they allow a platform for the voices of people's organizations, of farmers' organizations, of indigenous people's organizations to be heard uh, and to be part of uh, decision-making. And I think, you know, when we, when when we, when we look at, at how we can avoid situations such as Loliondo happening, uh, uh, again, many things need to be done, but, but first and foremost, the people who are affected need to be able to be spoken for their voice to be heard and to be influencing yeah. policies in their own country. Thank you, Henry. Tremendous Sorry for going on. No, no, it's okay. No, no, I, I did allow you to go on because I could, I, I could feel it, you know, and I saw those pictures on, on social media mm. of th those women who'd been shot in the leg and yeah. I was, I was shocking. Um, and it speaks to uh, some of the questions that are coming in. So thank you very much to all five. Let's have a round of applause for the five presentations. Uh, tremendous presentations and people have been inspired uh, to ask questions both in the chat box and maybe one or two here in the time we have left. We've got about 10 or so minutes left. Uh, Ward and Sue um, is talking about 
transparency, and this came in before your presentation, Michael, uh, saying what can be done for more transparency, I know you've given us a, a bit of a toolkit there, incentives for investors to make public their land investment data, but he says uh, none of the European countries have agreed to push this through, if I'm not mistaken, only Germany is looking into this at this stage. That, that's interesting. Is, is that right, Michael, as far as you know? If Ward says it, it's right, because he's the one who wrote the report. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> fine, fine. Ward did not declare uh, his, his, his origins. Yeah. Fine, fine. Well, I'm going to ask Gemma, actually, uh, coming from the, 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 the Netherlands, um, have, have you uh, put some heft, put some weight behind this, according to Ward, who seems to be the oracle on these, on these matters? Only Germany is looking into this, you know, giving incentives or incentives for investors to make public their land investment data. What's the position in the Netherlands? I, I do know that um, uh, a couple of NGOs have been working hard on this. Um, they are lobbying uh, some of the investment uh, investment banks to uh, to be more open about it. Um, but uh, I don't yeah like i also believe Wart actually <laughs> if he oh, says right, that okay. uh... <laughs> carol uh, do you believe Ward as well i mean uh, uh what no i don't think i don't oh, think no. that is uh, that is completely uh, that's completely open yet but i do agree with uh, the importance of transparency and also when do you want to become transparent about it um because it, it would of course be best uh, if you could already know uh, investment plans before, because then you can already um, start a well a discussion, a dialogue, uh, even before an investment is done. Um, but then you have a lot of pushback from uh, from private sector and investors um, that this is uh, for them. This is uh, not something that uh, that they can work with. Um, and but transparency is still important, also when when the investments are done. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, transparency, but it's it's of course extremely complex because uh, yeah. then you have, um, yeah, there's often a lot of different people involved in just one investment. So that's also something yeah. uh, that makes transparency probably even uh, even more difficult. Yeah. Understood, Gemma. Uh, Carol, do you have anything to add on this? What's the U.S. position? Oh, as um, I'm sure the audience knows, the U.S. does not have the same sort of ESG directives that the European Union has. Um, so it's uh, there has been perhaps less development uh, from our side than there has been from Europe. I will also say, though, if Ward says it, it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> well, this word seems to be very powerful. Um, let, let's uh, go talk, uh, Dr. Nam. Um, Namkolo uh, Kovic, Namukolo Kovic, who was one of our speakers yesterday, based in um, Ethiopia, talking about the issue of land rights, indeed, uh, and saying that even when people get their land rights, the land is still open to grabbing. We've just heard about the issue in, in Tanzania and elsewhere. And what she's observed, she says, is that the companies and indeed private individuals with the means offer to buy the land from poor people with little understanding of the value of their land. Those who sell the land then quickly become destitute now with no land for the subsistence farming that would have sustained them. Is this type of land grabbing scenario also getting some attention? Um, who wants to take that on? I'm just looking for any indication. Francisco, do you want to have any thoughts on that? I know, Michael, you'll have views on it, but uh, Francisco, what do you think? Yeah. Yeah, this is, a, of course, a serious situation. I, I can only comment on the, uh, the private sector perspective. That's yes. something that we pay attention, that we that the companies that we support, the partners that we work with are, are paying attention uh, to this issue and are not allowing uh, land grabbing and respecting the land rights of the, the indigenous people in the local communities. I think that's something that we, we, we are really looking into. And there is a uh, grievance mechanisms in our investments to be sure that in case there is something that is not uh, properly addressed, there is the, the way to be spoken and, and to be addressed uh, properly. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, Chris, let me bring you in on, on this. Your thoughts on this or, or, or on anything else you want to uh, address from earlier? Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I think this, this last question, I think, is really important. Um, and I, I don't think it's just a sort of external investor problem. Um, I mean, there's a whole 
a uh, lot of research on sort of small, uh, medium scale emergent farms in, uh, from or, or um, retired civil servants uh, investing in land uh, in many parts of the world, particularly in Africa, right? Uh, and, and, and actually being uh, primarily responsible for a lot of sort of local land grabs, if you will, and, and often it's, it's that lack of information, right? Uh, uh, poor people who are cash poor are offered money um, and don't un find it hard to sort of really um, uh, assess the value of that. So I think that's, it's a huge problem. I think, um, I mean, obviously part of the answer is helping communities understand the value of their land. Um, and I know one of our partners, Namati, have done some really interesting work through their land protection program to work with communities over up to six months really to go through a whole process to to to, to think through the value of land how they use it all the, the different benefits they, they they extract from it um and to use that as a basis for for negotiations right so that they can uh, are not uh, don't don't go into sort of short uh, on on the door kind of deals um but again to do that at scale that requires a huge amount of investment uh, across millions and millions of communities um so again i, I think i think the, the challenge is to work around uh, sort of in, in systems and that's often around local government local government but also national and i think i think when we say systems people we often think of sort of legislation and obviously legislation is really important but as as mike was pointing out i mean there's lots of countries that have fairly progressive legislation but it's not implemented in practice so i think we also need to sort of focus on the actual formal and informal systems in how land is allocated, right, irrespective of the legislation. Um, and obviously, many investors don't go through any formal process. They go to an MP or, or head of government and, and, and negotiate a deal. Um, so I think it's, it's about really trying to focus on that actual, actual process, formal or informal, and trying to work with the different stakeholders None of that's going to be easy because because of the vested interest. But I think unless we put more focus on that with civil society um, um, and and government, um, it's going to be hard to, to see significant progress. OK, Michael, yes. Yeah, just just quickly to add uh, in agreement to what everyone has said, probably the, the biggest and most pervasive form of land grabbing that's almost always invisible is against women. Yes. So women, women often suffer losing access to land when a husband dies or a father dies uh, or uh, and and uh, lose it to relatives, lose it to the chief or or, yeah. or in fact, don't even have their rights recognized uh, at the beginning. If you look at the statistics for recognition of women's land rights, it's absolutely abysmal. They're more yeah. than half the population, uh, and yet the numbers are, are incredibly low. That's changing in legislation, but we don't yet see the change in practice. No, no, on, on the ground, that's yep. right. A question from Karim Hussein, and then we'll get one final one from the room, I hope. Uh, to what degree do these initiatives that are private sector oriented uh, work in collaboration with farmers' organizations and decentralized and elected local authorities on land tenure issues and ownership of assets stroke profits. That's interesting. So collaboration with local organizations, uh, farmers, decentralized. Who's got uh, thoughts on that? I'm just looking for anyone who wants to take that one up. Yeah, I'll yes. jump in quickly. Um, oh, okay, sorry, Carol. Henry. No, Carol, go on, I, and then Francis. I, I'm sure EFAD does the same thing that we do. Um, in our work, we're always looking to work with local government officials uh, to make sure that we have um, engagement from those officials. They understand what we're doing. But, but importantly, yeah, very often working with farmers, cooperatives, or other farmers or local organizations, CSOs for sure. Uh, but in addition, these local organizations that are producers, because the point, part of the point of doing this work is to promote sustainable livelihoods and food security. So including those organizations is almost always um, an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, and I'll just leave it at there and turn it over to others. Right. Carol, thank you very much. Over to Francisco, uh, private sector specialist at uh, uh, IFAD. Sure, it goes to our heart. I think it, uh, IFAD has a, a long uh, history of supporting uh, uh, associative action from farmers, smallholder farmers. So we do support farmer organizations. It's something that we, we, when you are doing an investment, it's something that we try to, to, 
to privilege and support to, to give them the, the the space and incentives to 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 have uh, market access at uh, appropriate uh, and fair prices for instance if they are selling their output and uh, we do also pay, atten pay attention on the stakeholders so we do have in our investments stakeholder in stakeholder engagement uh, plans to be sure that uh, uh, all the key uh, the key stakeholders are involved and and here to, in case of uh, our investments. Tremendous. Friends. So thank you very much. We're slightly over our time. Now, unless anybody has something that they are bursting to say that they feel has not been said, that is missing, and that really needs to land right now, I'm going to wrap up this session and allow you to go for your break. Conrad, you're standing in between everybody and their coffee and their refreshment. So, so you've so got to I'm make it really good. Minutes. As, no, 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 no. <laughs> As your co-chair, I have to give you the floor. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks a lot to all the panelists. Really excellent and very fascinating presentations. Please do share them, as we said in the chat, uh, with the secretariat so they can be circulated. Yes. Just coming back to Mike at the end, uh, very interesting, though, very happy to hear, and also from Chris, that governments are actually standing up uh, and asking civil society to be involved. Now I'm a bit provocative. Um, one of your last slides, a re report from the land matrix, you mentioned that there's unsatisfactory compliance uh, in 84% of the countries. How do these countries then react to this statement? Do they a bit kick the responsibility away towards civil society or what's your what's your your take on this what what kind of feedback you get from the countries at the end of the day mm. and also on the three urgent tasks you you mentioned thank you uh -huh. yeah, yeah. I, I think there are many reasons for that but one is i think the vggts have been very successful in the land community but we haven't reached outside of the land community so we'll find you know when who comes to these kind of meetings would be land commissioners or secretary generals from the ministry of lands uh, and there will be there will be working hard to make partnerships with civil society there will be they they're familiar with the vgts but then ministry of finance ministry of minerals uh, you know the ones with the real money and the, and the power and and that are responsible for making these deals with investors have no clue about the vgts and so that's our real challenge is getting out of our land echo chambers. And I think this is maybe one of the challenges of the CFS because, because the CFS is largely um, mis ministers of agriculture and, and, and doesn't often go beyond that. Michael, thank you very much. I think we can land now, as they say in Ghana. If you see what I did there, you land, that means your argument is done. Yeah. When you land in a cry, it's done. Thank you very much indeed to our panelists. Let's say uh, thank you once more to Carol, to Gemma, to Chris. Francisco and to Michael. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much to those of you uh, tuning in online for your questions and those of us in the room. We're going to have a 15 minute break and when we come back we're going to talk about youth, their activities, their engagement during times of crisis and of course land and employment. Have a 15 minute break back in the room after that. Thank you very much. <laughs>